It was one of the few concessions McAfee made to his new Disney-owned employer when he brought his YouTube hit to the network in September in a five-year, $85 million deal. The label urges viewers to please bear in mind that the show is meant to be comedic informative. And so whenever I was interviewed by the mainstream media, the, their primary focus was, am I doing journalism on my blog? So the idea that there may be a different way to try to understand the world and there may be a different method for uncovering current events aside from journalistic ones uh, just rubs journalists the wrong way. So the, the first main profile of me, I think one of the first was on online journalism review. And, it was this, and then there was another online type of uh, journalism review that did a, another profile of me. And the focus is, you know, am I living up to the standards of journalism but i wasn't trying to always live up to the standards of journalism i did do some journalism on my blog but i did a lot of other things on my blog all right it had a lot of the talk radio element of uh, free-flowing conversation there was like personal confession essays there were you know, long form interviews and there was some reporting done but journalism is such a pretentious term right for reporting right if you're reporting right that that's solid and, and I, I respect reporting, but journalism is pretentious. Journalists love to use journalism and to move from instead of being reporters to journalists because it gives them more freedom, more power, more status to put everything what they were going to just simply report on, but that allows them to put it in context, to add more analysis, in other words, to add more opinion and so to be more professional. But uh, whether or not something is journalism is not really the most important prism through trying to understand things. And the mainstream media you know, hates web innovators, right? Particularly web innovators who don't uh, play things along the you know, conventional center-left hero system. And so you just hear the contempt just dripping out in this Atlantic article on Pat McAfee. And it also, this applies to the whole lab leak hypothesis because with regard to the lab leak, and I don't have a strong opinion either way, but with regard to the lab leak, it's obvious that the people with the most expertise are the least likely to endorse the lab leak. While the people who most strongly endorse the lab leak, right, they don't necessarily have uh, that much expertise in virology. So, there was a big New York Times article that's uh, gotten a lot of popular attention and it's received a lot of contempt, right? It's called Why the Pandemic Probably Started in a Lab in Five Key Points by Alina Chan. Okay, she's a molecular biologist at the Broad Institute, maybe it's the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and co-author of the book Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19. And so she's not a virologist, and virologists seem overwhelmingly united. They seem to have essentially circled the wagons with regard to lab leak theory, and they keep emphasizing it's much less likely than natural origin. And what are the incentives functioning here? Okay, so there are incentives for outsiders to say that virologists are circling the wagon and the virologists, through their carelessness, you know, gave the world this epidemic that's killed millions of people. So that's an exciting opinion to give. But virologists also have their own incentives. All right, if coronavirus likely came from a lab leak, then we need much more careful policing of labs. We need much more careful policing of virologists. They need much more regulation by outsiders because virologists, like other members of insular professional groups, right, overwhelmingly organize in their own self-interest and not in the public interest, All right? Being a virologist would become a dirty word if this pandemic was created by virologists. You've heard of firefighters who go out and light fires and start fires so that they can then sweep in and be the heroes. So I don't believe there's evidence that viro you know, any virologists in China deliberately constructed COVID and deliberately spread it. But if the lab leak theory is right, you know, virologists in China gave us the lab leak and then the repercussions of the coronavirus then rocketed their funding, rocketed their status, rocketed their invites onto TV and to write op-eds in newspapers. It raised their social status. So if the lab leak is true, virologists both gave us the virus and then became the preeminent experts in the virus. So 
I don't think these considerations are something for which virologists are just completely immune. So Dennis Prager often talks about how he is immune from all sorts of you know, human temptations that he would never compromise in or this or that. But virologists will lose status, right? Their profession will become a dirty word. They will be widely loathed by regular people if it turns out that coronavirus most likely came from a lab leak. They will face more regulation, right? They will face more investigation. They will have to jump through more hoops to get funding. Funding will become more difficult to, to achieve, right? Their lives will become much more difficult. So are they just completely immune from these incentives? I'm not sure they're completely immune, but right now the expert consensus by virologists and the people who would be most situated to know how COVID began, right? Their expert consensus is that natural origin is the most likely, but the news media consensus is that uh, you're very likely sat in a lab leak because that's sensational. Uh, that's interesting. So the sensational and the appealing and the interesting and that which emotionally feels good is like, F the experts, they gave us this pandemic in the first place, F them, all right? I can understand why that would feel good, but what feels good does not necessarily do good and is not necessarily true. But you see this same bowing to expertise in this profile here of uh, McAfee in the Atlantic, right? That he's not following journalistic protocol. And because he's not following journalistic protocol, all his conversations with Aaron Rodgers and all his conversations with professional athletes and everything he's done on his show, it won't last in history. Nobody will ever refer to it. Nobody will ever quote it. It has no value because he's not following journalistic protocol. So there's a new documentary on Amazon Prime called Blue Angels. It's about the US Navy fighter pilots who do those amazing stunts, the Blue Angels. And I just watched the first 20 minutes and it seems obvious to me that they have very strict protocols. All right. Uh, regular airline pilots follow very strict protocols because you get better results when people follow protocols. So it's not ridiculous that there is this journalistic fixation with journalistic protocols, just like it's not ridiculous that uh, virologists have certain protocols for how they understand the world, right? Usually uh, protocols that stand the test of time are more adaptive than maladaptive, but there's no reason that the protocols will always be the best solution. But I know from my own experience as an interviewer, there are certain protocols you should follow to do the best interview. You should not inject your opinions into the interview. You should not uh, condemn people in your questions because that just creates a defensive reaction and that just restricts how much they're going to share with you. So you should ask open-ended questions, not questions that end with yes, no. There should be a progression to your question and you should keep judgments and moral judgments in particular out of your interview. So there are definitely very useful protocols for airline pilots, for journalists, for doctors to make sure that you haven't left a sponge or some medical instrument inside of someone when you've done surgery. So there's a very good reason for protocols, but of course, sometimes the protocols can blind you. All right, back to the Atlantic essay on ESPN, just to set the scenes for further investigation of the lab leak hypothesis. Entertainment, in other words, not journalism, and that the often dopey opinions and sometimes false facts shared by him or his guests do not necessarily reflect the beliefs of anyone else at ESPN. The warning ends with a jokey plea, don't sue us.